and really to welcome back. Oh. <laughs> uh, do you got it? All right. All right. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce and really to welcome back Dr. Medina Sarvastani. Um, yeah, Medina really needs no introduction for, to many of you here. In fact, maybe I shouldn't be doing the introduction. I think former advisors and colleagues uh, uh, could do a better job, but uh, I'll give a little intro. Medina received her PhD in engineering uh, science and mechanics at Penn State University. Uh, there, she, she focused on studying, um, or I should say modeling brain rhythms um, that are involved in epilepsy. Uh, from there, uh, she joined the Penn community here, switching gears into visual neuroscience and working with um, Diego Contreras and, and Larry Palmer. And then uh, after um, her time at Penn, she uh, also did a postdoc with uh, David Fitzpatrick at the Max Planck Institute in Florida. Um, they're doing really some, some amazing foundational work on the organization of extrastriatal cortex in tree shoes. Um, and uh, after a time at MPFI, she, she joined the Department of Neurobiology and Behavior uh, at Cornell University, where she's currently an assistant professor. Uh, Medina's lab uses various animal models that elucidate how sensory and motor systems adapt to support animal uh, an animal's behavioral repertoire. Um, her research really highlights the tree shrew as a valuable animal model for investigating uh, neural circuits of complex behaviors. Uh, hopefully we will all move into the tree shrew as an animal model. I've, I've, uh, uh, tree shrews for all. Tree shrews for all, yeah. To that end, uh, Medina has co-founded and organizes the biannual tree shrew conference uh, and a, a really uh, fantastic gathering of, of everyone in tree shrew research. Uh, recently, Medina was named the Freeman Urbowski Scholar of the Howard Hughes Institute, a really amazing uh, honor there. Uh, and today, uh, Medina will be discussing how studying the body and one's sensory motor experience uh, can inform our understanding of the organization of sensory processing in the brain. Just really excited to hear uh, all that's going on in your research. So please join me in welcoming Medina. Thanks, Mike, for the invite. This is my first talk as a faculty member, so it's a fancy day. Uh, it's really nice to be back here. I really love my time in Diego's lab, and it's nice to see you guys. Hi, Yale. Um, and I love Philly, so thanks for having me. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two things today. I'm a visual neuroscientist, as you guys know, and I've spent now, I won't say how many years, but a good part of my career trying to understand how neurons in the brain translate or code the visual inputs that arrive at the retina. And the main method that I and most other visual neuroscientists use is to show controlled stimuli to the retina by putting it on a monitor in front of an animal that's prevented from moving too much, it's restrained. And then recording the brain activity uh, in neurons in visual areas and correlating these two things. That's what I'm gonna talk about in the first part of the seminar. I'm gonna present some results using this method, which has been really foundational for not only visual neuroscience, but computational neuroscience, the AI revolution we're currently undergoing. But it also has its limitations depending on the questions that you're interested in. So in the second part of the seminar, I'm going to talk about sort of how to move beyond the limitations of these recordings in restrained animals uh, to understand how our brains and bodies work together to produce our perceptions and actions. And please feel free to interrupt me. This is a nice small group. So understanding the neural code which is my primary task, is complicated by the fact that the visual system, as you all know, is a distributed hierarchical system. So you start at the retina, but from there, the visual input goes through the thalamus, the subcortical uh, visual centers. There's multiple relay points, and eventually you get back to the back of the head, primary visual cortex, where um, I do most of my recordings. So it's possible that at each of these relay stations, you know, the code changes or becomes more complicated or becomes simpler or higher dimensional. Uh, and 
you know, the overall wiring can be pretty complicated, but there's also, we've learned that there's sort of saving graces in some pretty simple organizational schemes. So for instance, we know that neurons in this area and also in this area like or prefer respond to uh, particular regions of visual space. This is called the receptive field or they like blue, but not red, or they like horizontal things on the retina, but not vertical things. That is, they have preferences. And one of the most robust organizational schemes that we've discovered is called retinotopy. Uh, I'm sure you guys are all really familiar with it, but I always start out with just a very basic database definition. So we're all on the same page. So retinotopy is related to the fact that A, neurons respond to little regions of visual space or sometimes bigger regions, but it's not all of visual space in the areas I'm talking about. And two, two neurons that like nearby regions on the retina or the visual space or the monitor, these are all sort of equivalent things, are physically nearby each other on the brain. So I'm gonna show you uh, some data here. You're looking at a top view of an animal that's restrained and it's looking at a monitor that has a moving bar and you're about to see brain activity recorded from a video camera above a cranial window that's implanted on this animal's head and the brain activity is being produced by calcium indicators. So I'm sure you can tell that there's a correlation here. This activity pattern is uh, highly correlated with the activity pattern on the monitor. And to make the relationship explicit, I'm gonna use a color code. So I'm gonna color each of these pixels on the left and right visual cortex of this animal here, according to the position of the bar that produced the greatest bit of activity. And this is called the retinotopy map because it's basically a topographic representation of what we showed on the monitor or the retina. And so it's really easy to imagine, it's almost trivial uh, to imagine how you go from what's on the retina, the map on the retina, to the map on the cortex. You basically you can put a net on here, flip it upside down, squeeze it a little bit, and you get the activity pattern on the cortex. So this is called formally a conformal transformation. It's related to the fact that these local angles, these relationships are preserved here. But basically, you can think about it like the retinal image is preserved here. You can still see it. It still more or less looks the same. I'm just going to call this a simple transformation. And I'm showing you this axis of visual space. There's another axis in the opposite direction, but basically the mapping is simple and similar. And so this is sort of comforting in some ways because it shows you that the neural activity patterns on the brain have some relationship to the external world that's very easy for us to understand and measure. And in basically every mammal study so far, there is this area in the back of the head that we call V1 that has a simple map of visual cortex like this. And in fact, all other visual areas beyond V1, there are several, there's a bunch of higher order visual regions, are defined by their own retinotopy map. So these maps, these topographical projections, uh, these topograph topographical organizational schemes on the brain are really foundational to how we define brain areas and therefore how we understand the functional and structural organization of the brain across different species. And this is where things get pretty interesting, at least to me, because beyond V1, there's this elongated area in all of these mammals called V2. It's one synapse over, so it's called V2. And V2 has been difficult to study because it's not well defined in small animals like rodents. In fact, in rodents, there's not, it's sort of shown here like there is a V2, but these areas have been sort of split up into multiple areas. And then in larger animals like cats and primates, uh, a lot of it is stuck in a fold. So you really have to you know, do these heroic experiments where you stick electrodes at very odd, difficult angles. Uh, we studied V2 in the tree shrew, which is sort of a nice middle point. It's a small animal but it has a smooth cortex. So it has a V2, but it's not hidden. So it's just easy to study. That's a tree shrew. 
But have you guys actually seen them? I mean, you have tree shrews here. Mike studies them, but I wonder how many of you guys have seen them. They're really remarkable animals. They're extremely nervous and jittery. They move around like squirrels. They're not rats. So for, for many reasons, they're good study animals for the visual motor system, for navigation, for all sorts of things. So here's an animal, here's a head fixed tree shrew. Uh, and this is sort of our experimental trap. So we have these cameras on them. We can look at their eye movements, know how small and sort of weak their whiskers are. They don't really whisk to get around the world. And we have these cranial windows uh, coupled with calcium indicators that allow us to measure their sort of uh, population activity or using a two photon in the same window, single cell resolution activity. Uh, and I've already mentioned a couple of the advantages that they have, but the fact that viral vectors work, that's still been sort of a difficult um, transition in primates and cats, but most viral vectors designed in mice work in tree shrews. They have a smooth brain, they're small, their gestation is short. So once you get past breeding difficulty, which I'm going through right now, they're really good sort of lab animals to have for multiple reasons. So... The main question of this study from my postdoc that uh, I'm going to tell you about was what do the maps look like in B2? They, there had been sort of some very fascinating results published in primates in the 80s, but the question wasn't really fully resolved in primates and no one had looked at uh, representation of visual activity in tree shrews beyond V1 because you had to study it in awake animals. when when uh, we put tree shrews under anesthesia, like actually many other animals, but specifically in tree shrews, everything beyond V1 is silent. So part of what I did in order to be able to perform the study is to sort of train the animals to remain still and not that stressed out. And this takes a couple of weeks, but remain stationary while restrained, but awake, importantly, so I could measure their neural activity in these areas. So we expected the map going into the study, we expected the map in V2 to kind of look like the simple map in V1 because this was the majority of maps studied. Yeah. When you're talking about the maps in this case, are you talking about positional maps? Yeah, or positional maps. So no features of no the features. position that we're concerned with for the moment? Okay. It's part of the study. I'm not going to focus on okay. that. Yeah, so these are all retina topy maps. That's yeah. the only maps we'll talk about. Medina, before you went to yeah. more sophisticated stuff, when you say that in anesthesia, everything beyond V1 is silent, that's not surprising. But uh, the activity in V1, has anybody compared V1 in anesthetized and non-anesthetized? Yeah, I have. I mean, not, you know, not carefully. There's definitely game changes. Uh, the spontaneous, so not stimulus driven, the spontaneous activity is structurally a little different, but at the level of maps, it's basically identical. Which, which isn't surprising. What anesthesia did you use to make the comparison? Uh, the yeah, that's an important question. This was, in every case, isofluorine. Okay, okay. And I'd be really curious okay. about ketamine and other, other anesthetics. And uh, one last question. V, V1 obviously is plumber organization, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank that's you. another advantage of studying tree shoes. I won't really talk about it, but there are many features, several features of their visual system is primate-like, including the fact that they have these orientation columns, which used to be a really big deal 40 years ago. They have these orientation columns in their visual cortex, uh, which is a primate feature that rodents don't have. Okay, so what we found, this is what we expected. What we found was the sort of complicated striped representation of the visual field. It looked like there were multiple copies of the visual field in this one area. And I'm gonna sort of now walk you through the data before we get back to what this means. So again, we injected calcium indicators in a little region at the border of V1 and V2. So we would always have V1 and the same cranial window as a control. And I'm not going to get the entire length of B2 because it's this elongated region and our cranial windows are circular, but I'll get enough of a sample of it. And then in the plots, V2 is on the left, V1 is on the right, and this red line is both the 
anatomical border between B1 and B2, and the neurons near this border represent the vertical meridian, which is an imaginary line separating the two visual hemifields. And I'm going to show you the threshold of calcium response in this cranial window uh, in response to these bars that are moving on the monitor. So the color map is there just to visualize. It's just a black bar on a gray monitor. Regina. Yeah. If you have questions that, like, that you're asking now, yeah. how, how do you define B2 before you've yeah. measured? I mean, how do you know? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Uh, before you measure, there's sort of some estimates you can make. But uh, really, it's the it's the functional differences between the maps. Before you measure, it's difficult. You, you just have there to use. Multiple, there are multiple yeah. subregions. Yeah. So is it okay, B1A, B2, B2A, B2B or something? Um, I'll show you in a second. Okay. That's a Thank deeper you. question. Yeah. OK, so I now I'm going to move the bar up on the monitor, and you'll see the corollary pattern in V1. And V2 sort of moves with the bar as expected. So this is the map of elevation or the vertical dimension. And then if I use the color map to show you the retinotop map on V1 and V2, it sort of looks like a flipped version on, of the monitor. V2 is a little more complicated, but it basically looks like V1. So if I was trying to find the boundary between these two regions using the elevation map, it would be difficult. Is it here? Is it here? It's hard to say. The azimuth map, or the horizontal dimension of space, looks very different. So I'm going to do the same exercise. And V1, when I show the bar, this is right at the vertical meridian. There's a corollary blob of activity. That's what we expected. And the blob moves with the bar, essentially, as we expected. But note that in V2A, there's multiple bars. They're orthogonal to the bar in V1. They're in the opposite direction, as if I'm still showing elevation bars. And the distance between them seems to sort of go in and out. So these were all strange things that took us a while to wrap our heads around. And if I uh, look at the color map, it looks something like that for this region. There are these stripes that change between regions near the vertical meridian and the red and orange color and regions about 20 and some animals 25 degrees out closer to the periphery in this blue color. And if I move this window across the length of V2, it's just more of these stripes. There's about, about five of them. Yeah. Kieran, so, what is the relation of the spatial coverage here to the binocular overlap zones versus monocular? Tree shrews have pretty lateralized eyes. So like rats, they have like 40 degrees of binocular. So this is all within the binocular region. So when I say peripheral, it's more peripheral. It's not actually in the monocular yeah. region. Can I just ask Mike what's more than any question? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, uh, while they have a huge binocular overlap, it's much less than I think primates, right? Yeah. And so, sort of curious if one of the factors that could be driving this is a differential between binocular and monocular overlap zones, or, you know, could yeah. be to the, you know, difference in So it could be, sense, but... yeah, no, it could still be a differential, but it's very nuanced if it is, because this is all well within the yeah. binocular yeah. range. Yeah. Okay, so when, when we were sort of developing the study, it wasn't immediately clear like it was in B1, how you would go from the color scheme on the monitor or the retina or V1, because V2 receives its inputs from the retina, not directly, but through V1. So how you would go from these regions, which all have the same sort of mapping to this mapping. And since this is published, I'm gonna kind of cut to the chase, but it's basically, we called it a sinusoidal transform in hindsight, that may not have been the best term, but it's, you can get from here to here by taking this net, stretching it until it's basically a one-dimensional rope, it's no longer two-dimensional, and then folding it, that rope onto itself. That's how you get the striped representation. So these, these stripes are really coming from the folds of this rope. And in fact, that's what, that's what made us realize that this is really a single representation and not multiple distinct maps. And that's because if you 
Right, so here's sort of the sinusoidal or snaky transform. And if you apply that just to the original map, you get the stripe representation. And now for the other direction, for the elevation, now you're moving along the snake transform. So you get just this one copy of the elevation map. So together they form one representation, one map, not a bunch of little maps. That's the idea. So unlike every other map reported, well, almost every other map reported in the literature where you have some version of the simple transformation, sometimes it has cuts, sometimes it's sort of divided up between different parts of the brain. But basically the simple representation we found that comes from a simple transform, a Cartesian one-to-one -one mapping, we found a more complex transform that traverses the two dimensions of the visual field combines them into one so that you end up with a striped representation along one dimension and a smooth, simple representation along the other. And the point here is that these maps do not preserve the retinal image. So if this was a flower, you will still see flowers here or Mona Lisa, people usually use that. And here it's, it's entirely shuffled up. You're really sort of reshuffling and combining the two axes of this retinal image here. So in some ways, the image is not preserved, but the very local relationships in space still are. Okay. And what this does, what the sinusoidal transform does is to bring two points that are sort of far apart in space that are about 20 degrees apart and placing them closer together on the brain. That's the idea. And you can sort of do some hand wavy explanations about what that might be useful for, maybe foreground, background, extraction, maybe not. Sorry, I can't resist saying this. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, probably if you look at the cortex, V1 and V2, they look exactly the same in the sense of the pyramidal cell dendritic branches are the same sizes, the local or axonal uh, patches mm -hmm. or horizontal connections are the same sizes, mm -hmm. and therefore the geometry of the cortex and the transfer in the local connectivity uh, decay is probably the same like it is everywhere in the cortex. And so I think that that's a great thing is that the functional, uh, the functional distribution of activation by the image is then placed on the processor, which is the same in different ways. So you get different results. So you know what I'm saying? Sort of. And yeah, I agree. I mean, you're you're doing different transformations on this retinal image. So you have so that you one circuit. Do... You, only, you only have one circuit. You don't have the biology doesn't have the luxury to adapt the cortex to be different. Yeah. And different. Yeah. It's always the same, no matter where the patches are similar. I just from... pause because this is arising from the wiring pattern between B1 and B2. Of the connections, but of not the, the local cells. The local. Yeah, not the local cells. The, right. The yeah. local circuit, I bet you, is I, I, absolutely the same, very, very, very similar. Mm -hmm. Just Depends like how you everywhere. define similar, but yeah, well, yeah, you have yeah. pyramidal cells and the connectivity Local falls connectivity, off. Current connectivity, particularly because okay. there is also columns in B2, right? So the, the amplification factors are the same, but the inhibitory regulation of flow, vertical flow is probably the mm -hmm. same. So you have a, this generic processor, and the cool thing is this, yeah. this amazing effort to put this image in a different coordinate. In, in, in a coordinate system that is different to the same processor. Yeah, I think the general idea is, and I'll sort of hint at some ways we're trying to figure it out and maybe ultimately we won't. The general idea is there must be something useful about this image transformation when you have a V1 image transformation that's already there. Well, there must be something additionally useful. Sorry, I'm yeah. paying in the ass, but I'm gonna say this. Yeah. This will come out the day we understand what lateral interactions do to any brain processing whatsoever, <laughs> which we don't. And second, when we understand what vertical interactions do to any processing whatsoever, other than transformation from simple cells to complex cells, which we don't understand. The day we do that, it will be crystal clear why this, this transformation is happening. I don't think so. <laughs> I think I think at the level of perception and 
because well, I'll talk about that at the end. Yeah. It. So, and wanted to ask whether in the three group there is a like the split. Ventral dorsal split is something that's mm -hmm. studied, and where yeah. these be two falls in there. I, I yeah, that's for, a good question. The and that, that fits in my transition. Um, we don't know. The stripes in V two suggest that there should be because so this is this is a good point to transition to this slide. Uh, when we saw this, right, we thought, okay, but is this just a weird tree shrew thing? Uh, and we we knew that maybe it wasn't because based on our knowledge of primate B2. So in the 80s, there was a series of, I think, absolutely beautiful papers where they showed that if you look at the functional organization, and by that, I mean how neurons along the length of V2 represented orientation. So two neurons that liked similar orientations on the visual cortex of macaques were sort of all together in these little stripes. And then if you went over to this piece of meat, this piece of tissue, the neurons still preferred orientation, but they didn't have this organization that showed up as these nice columnar patches. And this sort of repeated itself. So we had some, uh, some prior reported work in primate V2 of some sort of striped representation. And we thought, could it be that underlying this orientation organization is some sort of similar sinusoidal transform that produced the striped retinotopic map. And maybe these two are related. Uh, and that's that's sort of where I went with your answer, with your question there. In primates, these different stripes lead to the dorsal or ventral stream. That's why I think in tree shrews, there's very likely to be a dorsal and ventral stream. Uh, but we just don't know much about the higher order regions. That's that's part of what my lab is doing. Is that, is that shown? Is that data or is that a model? This this is a depiction of electrode-based data. The second one, this stripe thing. Electrode like and the, intrinsic imaging. Yeah. But your one. your results, your neuron, beautiful neuron paper, your result in the squirrel, in the, the tree shrew is not being ripped, is is not yet published in macaque. Right? It is not because, well, we can do intrinsic imaging in macaque, but that's still pretty low resolution. We can't do good calcium imaging. And also you'd have to do it in marmosets because in macaque, a lot of it too yes. is sort of okay. hidden. But I I can't wait for, yes, 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 for yes, this yes, in course. macaque to see yes. if you know my I idea holds or not. Yeah, yeah. Huge deal. Yeah. You have thick and thin stripes in V2 and macaques, right? right. And that... You know, if you look locally, there is some repeating retinotopy, right? Because you have yeah. functional streams. But if you do something very broad, like fMRI, yes. you still see yeah. this smooth map. And yeah. just, you know, embedded within that at the yes. order of hundreds of microns, you get more of these local discontinuities. I'm wondering yeah. if that's analogous here, where you get, with your zoomed-in window, a much more sensitivity to local you know, variations in the red. Yeah, that's field. exactly like what zoom I zoom out. That's like exactly tree what fMRI. Exactly. And actually, with, no, with tree shrew fMRI, I think you would still, I think part of the complication, and this is going a little off stream here, but uh, primates have a fovea, and the fovea, the high resolution center of the retina, uh, sort of makes the maps of visual space really non uniform because it's overrepresented. Yeah. And I think that complicates the primates map in a way that the tree shrew maps are not. Tree shrews don't have a phobia, their maps are more uniform. Yeah. You go back one slide. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm curious about the question mark. Yeah. So it's clear that the analogous study hasn't been done in primates. Right, yeah, right, right. right. So, but I'm wondering, so there's a question mark whether it actually happens, but if you do a computational analysis, starting with orientation columns in V1, and then apply this transformation, do you get things that look statistically like what you has been measured using magic yeah. technology yeah. in V2? Uh, yes, and it has to do with, it has to do with sort of this weird caveat Yes, you get mixing of orientation in between the stripes. And it has to do with the fact that as you get 
near this vertical meridian near the border of V1 and V2, you sort of see there's these orientation patches get elongated. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of there's fewer orientations to pass through, and that's why you get these patches out here. And that's the representation sort of in some regions out here more peripherally, you just have more orientations. So it gets it gets more mixed. And so you don't have these blobs. So it's a first patches. first order approximation. First order approximation. Like, yes. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sort of. But really, we need to wait for the imaging data. Yeah. There is a little bit of evidence from uh, electrode penetration. So if if we sort of pretend that this was an electrode, and we can do that by extracting the preferred position, use it on the on the maps we got from Casio imaging, extracting the preferred position of each of these pixels. So using sort of undoing the color map and plotting that here. That's sort of like we went through with an electrode. So this is cortical distance along the length of V2, and this is the change in preferred receptive field position. And you see you get this sort of sinusoid because the stripes are going back and forth. That's our finding. And if you look at you know the original beautiful groundbreaking work in primates where they did actually stick an electrode along the length of V2, this is the change in receptive field position. It's pretty small because you have this sort of foveal magnification. But the interpretation was that you have these linear maps, these linear changes in preferred receptive field position. And then around the edge of one of these stripes, there's a resetting, so piecewise linear map. But I think, you know, maybe it's something closer to that. And that's why it's a question mark, because I think with the data right now, it could really be really be um, either way. And we need high resolution imaging in macaques and maybe even fMRI and tree shrews to tooth that apart. OK, so once we understood this transform just at the just at the map level, we wondered mechanistically how it could happen because we know that much of the inputs to V2 come from V1. And in fact, almost all of the retinal inputs to V2 come from V1. And sort of as crazy as it sounds, we actually confirmed that the sinusoidal transform that I showed you is a pattern of connectivity, is being built by the pattern of connectivity between V1 and V2. So we tend to think of synaptic connectivity, particularly direct monosynaptic connectivity, as pretty simple linear operations, but we'll show you that something more complicated can happen. So, and we're looking at the connectivity uh, and its relations between two areas by injecting two different viral tracers, two different colors in V1 and seeing where they end up in V2. And this isn't data, this is just, I just sort of took this flipped it and squished it a little bit, but this is what was expected. If the maps were smooth, or if this was a mouse, basically this is the pattern we expect between two visual areas. <clears throat> what we saw was this. So I'll give you a second to sort of look at it. So there's a couple of things going on here. First, each of these points is producing multiple regions of connectivity, not one, in V2. There's holes in between these regions and the color order flips between these holes. So here you go from orange to green, there's a hole, green to orange and vice versa. So this is exactly what you, you would expect if you actually took a sinusoid across V1 and you plot it down sort of every time you go through, you plot it the color that you traverse through. And the reason there are holes is that we just don't have viral tracers here. So every time you sort of go into this empty region, there's a space. That was really exciting. And I wanna point out that the color order here changes. So, <clears throat> That's important to point out because in the mouse literature, there's been this sort of tradition of every time the color order changes for these sort of viral injection experiments, you say that's a new area. 
So here they're doing a pretty similar experiment. Here are the color order changes. That's an area. Here, that's an area. So the area boundaries are really defined by these color orders. And of course, this is based on the presumption that retina top P maps are simple beyond B1, and you would have one-to-one -one mapping. And I don't mean to say that this is all V2, and this is all a single area, and since so it'll transform, people have followed up this study with lots of functional studies to try to understand these areas. There, do, there does seem to be something more complicated. There does seem to be at least two areas here. But my point is just we need to revisit these assumptions of how we define areas. Yeah. You see any differences in the, I don't know if you have enough data to really assess this yet, but um, differences in the thickness of the bands in the projections as you move march along V2? Uh, we didn't really. <laughs> this is related to primate differences. Yeah, or like right. like you know, so if you're getting projections thick and thin stripes, if they sort of yeah. differ on uh, if they were, it'd be interesting if they seem to be more uniform or if they do vary, and maybe that's I, indicative that they might be different. You know, uh, supporting different I types looked of for that, and I really couldn't find any evidence to support it. So my talking about the fact that in primates there's multiple types of stripes in B two. Some are thick, some are thin. I think, I think there's really just two sets here. The ones that are more central, the ones that are less central. I didn't see any differences in thicknesses or anything like that. Are the, are the dimensions that are getting smooshed together um, always aligned with the vertical and horizontal dimensions of the receptive field uh, of the yes. visual field? Yes. So it all and which one is the one that gets gets all stripey, and which one is the per preserved? This dimension, azimuth horizontal, is the one that's that gets stripey, and this one is preserved. Yeah. So this the transform is always this way. Okay. So. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip over these simulations. Anybody that read your paper says it's amazing. <laughs> What's that? Thanks, Diego. Anybody that read the neuron paper where the stripes form all of the sinusoidal transformation says that. Diego says with complete objectivity. Um, I'll skip past this. The, there's almost certainly some self-organization here because you can you can explain the formation of these two different maps, a simple map versus this sort of stripey map that that's produced by the representation folding in on itself, you can simulate that by basically changing none of using a self-organization simple model and changing nothing except the aspect ratio of the cortical area. So my point is there doesn't have to be any magic. V2 in all of these areas is elongated. The same self-organizing principles that give rise to regular retinotopy maps can be used to explain the map in V2. The question is, well, why is it elongated? Is this sort of becomes a chicken and egg scenario? Um, so, you know, why questions are difficult? Why do we have the sinusoidal representation? What are the striped uh, maps or what's the squeezing and azimuth useful for? This is this was sort of my favorite question to think about in the study, and it really influenced my research direction because I realized that I realized that with what I was measuring, I couldn't come close to even negating answers. And I'll tell you why. So one answer to why might be that the sinusoidal transform, make certain types of visual inputs easier or more efficient for the brain to handle. And to show you what I mean, I'm gonna show you another transform, the log polar transform that's been observed in V1 of certain primate species. Uh, it's a conformal transform in the sense that it preserves local relationships, but it has additional nice properties resulting from the fact that it converts polar angle and radius on the retinal image to horizontal and vertical dimensions on the cortex. So it looks something like this. Okay. So the log polar transform, which has been observed in primate V1, converts this sort of map into this and this sort of map into that. And to see why that's useful, if you have a bar that's rotating on the retinal image, the transformation on the cortex, the equivalent corollary activity 
is just sort of a translation. And if you have something that's expanding in radius, the corollary activity is a translation in the opposite direction. So you're changing rotation and expansions, which, which are useful because this is constantly what's happening to your real, real retinal inputs. Every time you rotate your head, the image could rotate. Every time you go near to something or something comes close to you, the image could expand. So these are frequent retinal inputs that are important for survival. That's sort of what we tend to say. And this transform makes them into easier things, possibly more efficient computations or act activation patterns on the cortex. We know because of nearby connectivity rules that waves of patterns are simple or cheaper for the cortex to compute than two-dimensional rotations or expansion based activities. That's the idea. So can we tell a similar story with the transform in V2? I'm setting it up and then you're going to be disappointed. So in V2, the pattern of input that produces the smooth translational activity looks like this. That would be what has to happen on the retinal image in order to get V2 to activate from one side to the other. Is there a pattern of body movements that would generate this input on the retina? Yes, but that's pretty unusual. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. And, <laughs> and you know, tracers are unusual animals. It could, they do do, they basically scan their environment with their heads rather than their, their eyes. They do do a lot of these very fast back and forth scanning movements. So this could approximate the sinusoidal input, but, but I think we really can't answer this question. We don't know how often they make these movements. We don't know if these movements are important for their sur survival. If you somehow prevented an animal from making this movement, would the maps in V2 arise? But but I think if in that general, was an eye, wouldn't that yeah. look like a saccade? Huh? If that was an eye, wouldn't that look like a saccade? Yeah. No, I mean, and these are these have been called head saccades because they're using it to sort of change their gaze in the world. Do um, they spend a lot of time in the trees? At this particular species. Some, but there are other species of tree shrews that are almost entirely arboreal. This guy spends a lot of time on the ground too. So my my point is that this sort of led me led me to feel that I, in order to understand and be able to answer why questions about structure and function of visual systems, I needed to understand what the real visual patterns that these animals experience are, which is of course shaped by their movements. And in these animals, it's very much shaped by their movements because their movements are so acrobatic. So the research program in my lab uh, uses tree shrews and rats because they're animals that are sort of similarly sized with similarly sized brains. Their eyes are sort of about the same height off the ground and about the same position in their head but they move very differently. And so we can sort of use this variable to try to understand how do movements shape visual inputs and how does that then shape the structure and function of the visual system? So to really drive the point home here, here's a slowed down video of a tree shrew in its home cage. They do these flips when they're stressed, when they're bored, uh, when they sometimes hear a loud noise, and it's not just a stereotypical stress response. They just really like to do this. As long as the structure of their cage allows them to flip like this, they do. So imagine if there was a head-mounted camera on one of these animals, what the, what the inputs from that flip would look like and how different that would be from anything a rat ever experiences. So that's exactly what we're doing. The first direction as the lab is to understand the statistics of real visual inputs in these animals uh, that's created by their movements. So the first pass of this, we're doing with these little wireless head-mounted cameras. And then now you see why everything that's head-mounted on these animals has to be wireless. Um, we can't track eye movements. That's the next version of this. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you know, any wire would immediately get tangled up. But this is their essentially GoPro feed. And then we have these two high resolution cameras that allows us to use all of these uh, established pose less tracking techniques like deep lap cut to estimate their movements and the resulting visual input. So I'll just play that. It's and of course, there's no VOR here, so it looks a little nauseating, but the range of movements that these animals make is often beyond the 
the VOR reflects itself and beyond what would be corrected with VOR anyway. So people started sticking, I think Conrad Cording has a paper in 1997 where they stuck a GoPro camera, a little wireless camera on a cat. So these feeds are not new, but they couldn't really get much from this data because they didn't also have the movements of the animal. So they couldn't say, okay, well, there is this much mutual information between the movements and the visual inputs, or for certain movements, the visual input is completely predictive of the movement because it's say translation only for other movements where you mix translation and rotation, you can't use the visual input to extract out the movement. So you might need motor copy. So there's a lot of information I, I think to be gained by understanding the, the latent structure of the video and the movements and the relationship. So that's sort of project one. And then we're doing this in multiple animals. This is sort of a joke. But the point is to show you how in the same enforced visual environment and the same enforced objects, <laughs> rats and tree shoes are just going to move in fundamentally different ways. So we expect pretty easy. And we, we have we've done a first pass through this data. Their visual input statistics are very clearly different because their movements are very clearly different. And I'll just say that I'm not, I'm not someone who, who thinks that rodents have bad vision rodents have perfect vision for rodents it's just not primate like at all rodents, good point yeah you know they they have their behavior vision for their rats. rodent behavior right yeah good, good point okay so the second direction and i'm really excited about this in part because it's difficult it's to revisit the neural code that was defined in restrained animals so i told you at the very beginning we've gotten pretty good at um, defining the preferences of different neurons in relation to particular features of controlled artificial inputs like ratings or bars or dots. So some instant, for instance, some neurons prefer horizontal lines, horizontal bars, and these preferences are stable. You go back two weeks later, that neuron still responds maximally to a horizontal thing and not a vertical thing. So we define sort of the identity of neurons in response to the sensory input pattern on the retina. And I think that that might not, I and many other people think that that might not be the whole story. So it might be that instead of responding to just the sensory pattern, what the neurons are coding for is a combination of sensory and non-sensory, namely motor or proprioceptive, which is sensory, but retinal and non-retinal signals that the brain has access to. So for instance, imagine this shrew looking at this horizontal branch. When the animal then makes a head movement in the vertical direction, what's on the retina is going to change entirely. If the animal made a head movement left to the right, what's on the retina would change a little bit. So there's information about objects in the world that's there in this relational signal, how the retinal input changes as a function of what the body was doing. And I, I think it might make sense that neurons in the earliest part of the visual system, visual cortex, superior colliculus, might be coding for the sensory motor thing because that has information about real physical objects in the world and not just what lands on the retina. And so the difficulty is that these two things are sort of hard to distinguish from each other normally. A branch looks horizontal, it produces that horizontal pattern on the retina, but it also responds in this way. So you need to have a way to change the retinal input from how it changes as you move your body, right? But you can do that using a very old technique, which is prism goggles. So there are prism goggles that shift the image you guys probably have experience with that. You, you go to reach forward and you actually go over here, but there are also other types of prisms that actually invert the image. So flip it upside down or flip it across the vertical meridian. And so you can use one of these goggles to essentially manipulate the sensory input in whatever way you want. So it doesn't match what's out there in the world. And you can see if, if the code, if the preference of the neurons is changing, to reflect what's out there in the real world versus what's on the sensory input pattern, 
then it might suggest that the code is richer than just faithfully responding to the retina. If it doesn't, then the code has been all the while just sensory and it's okay if we keep studying animals in a restrained way. So it's obvious that this sort of transformation has to happen at some point in the system yeah, whether exactly. it's localized in the individual yeah. or on a population or whatever was totally excluded. The question boils down to what whether or not it's likely that you'll observe these sorts of what's the right way of putting it, joint coatings, let's yeah. say, um, in the earliest visual areas as opposed to higher, yeah. higher up. So yeah. what's what's what are you banking? Why are you yeah. why are you yeah. gonna invest a good chunk of your first several yeah. years in your position? To Two reasons. A, I think we've never really asked this question. It is an open question. Uh and it's an efficient way for the brain to process multi-sensory inputs that it has access to rather than like this. I think this distinction of visual system, auditory, motor is uh, artificially imposed on the brain by our sort of simplistic and, and historical understanding. The second reason is there is a paper published in Nature by a Japanese scientist in the early 90s where he essentially did this experiment in primates that were reared with goggles. And he showed that if you put prism goggles that invert the visual field left to right, there are some neurons that respond that normally neurons respond to the contralateral visual field. There are some neurons that still maintain the contralateral visual field after three weeks of prisms, but also now have sort of dual receptive fields. And so there's some evidence that the neurons are somehow sort of gaining access to the physical reality. That two of those neurons have to exist near the vertical meridian. They're not that close to the vertical really? meridian. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Which, which area? V1. It was, okay. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So, you know, maybe, maybe nothing happens in V1 or the superior colliculus, but we know at the behavioral level, if you put these goggles on, humans or, or primates, uh, you immediately, you sort of recalibrate your senses so that you can exist in this new inverted image reality. But after several weeks, something else happens. It's, we call it realignment, where you no longer have to sort of intentionally correct your motor actions because uh, your perceptions are, you no longer sort of see the world as upside down anymore. And I'm, I'm interested in trying to see if there's anything in the visual cortex that changes in that in that time. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Um, we're interested in understanding how our body shapes our brains and we're using the visual system and these critters as a tool to do that. Yeah, thanks guys. Thanks for making it interactive. <laughs>
but but I'd love to be able to get back to that at some point. Sure. Sure. Just so the question is different. What what percent of the total visual field is by money? Is it also similar percent in rodents? Any yes, that? because the total visual field is similar. also so the, the, similar. The, in rodents, the eyes are off like 60 degrees. Yeah, in tree shoes, it's like 50 degrees. Okay. Yeah, so they're really not cats or... or in ferrets, you know, in ferrets? ferrets yeah, in also, ferrets, uh, in ferrets their eyes are much more frontal. So I think their binocular visual field is like 60 degrees or something. And Ishan, at uh, one point you briefly mentioned about the ratio of elevation to azimuth or, or sort of the map aspect ratio, mm -hmm. maybe informing whether or not you see in the self-organization that sinusoidal pattern. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, so one question of clarification, was that only considering V1 or was that considering aspect ratios of V1 and V2? So and that is just V2. So it's just so it's not like we define an area, but it's V2 because mm -hmm. we keep the biological constraints with the self-organizing model. And one of them is one border has a vertical meridian. So I suppose it could be V1 or V2. I mean, we don't define these areas, but we had one area, not two. Yeah. I think it's I think that's super interesting because it exactly. could imply that the physical structure, number of yeah. neurons, density, yeah. could be dictating what sort of map forms. Yeah, yeah. and I have to say, I can't take credit for that idea, though. Their, uh, Fred Wolf's master's thesis was essentially that. I mean, not exactly this idea. They didn't know about this transform, but he sort of put it out there. And I just I just picked it up and tested it on here. And I think I think it's a really valid idea. <laughs> It definitely implies, like, yeah, maybe this could be their, you know, intrinsically prior to experience. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the ten percent of my brain, I wasn't using to listen to you. I was trying to work out like exactly what regions of visual space end up near to each other in V two. Yeah. Could you tell me what that answer is? Because I yeah, can't figure like it out. And then directly the ahead. Up. Yeah, it's. So it's multiple regions, but basically any regions that are about 20 degrees apart will become much closer than they would be otherwise under a normal map on the brain. So it could be zero degrees and about here, or it could be five degrees and about here, but 20 degrees apart. So. I guess the way I want to think, I'm just yeah. trying to think, imagine you take a particular location in B2 mm -hmm. and then go some epsilon and cortical distance yeah. symmetrically around it. Yeah. If you were to draw on the whiteboard, like what areas of visual space yeah. does that? that yeah, work? it becomes elongated. So normally in B1, it would be a circle. Mm -hmm. In B2, it would it's be- just a big stripe. Yes, okay. it would be much longer along the horizon than vertical. Uh, I, I think that you mentioned at some point during the talk that okay, for reasons like mm -hmm. this map must be because of some uh, like reason like what you were saying yeah. like statistics and stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, I see the auto organization map kind of explanation like as some alternative to that where you have an explanation where you get that pattern that it has nothing to do with it. With like a why question, so yeah, I, 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 I know something wrong or no? Why questions are fun, <laughs> and I sort of use it as a transition to why I'm suddenly interested in movement behavior. I think you're right, but I, I think the caveat there is, in all of these mammals with different organization to their visual system and to some degree their brain, B two is elongated. So yes, once you start with that a priori that you have this elongated area past V1, the self-organization is trivial. But why have multiple animals, why has a, an elongated region past V1 stuck around, I guess? And the why could just be completely internal to brain structure because it's easier to get V1 information to other higher visual areas if you have this sort of elongated region that brings regions in the middle of v1 and regions further back in v1 close together it might just be wiring efficiency but i i think something should explain why it sticks around okay yeah, yeah. and maybe it's just just brain chemistry or physics and it has nothing to do with yeah. representation yeah 
any um, evidence about <laughs> squirrel? Um, just because there is an answer to stereopsis, they are using you know de depth. They make the same kinds of leaps, but they have no similar, at least massive orientation, right? They fall into the sort of quasi rodent. I mean, they are a rodent, but they yeah. like sort of live in that topographic sort of lama, you know, <laughs> inner inner space, right? Yeah, I don't know about squirrel. So the the animals that we have evidence for striped B2 representation, it's either functional maps, but much more often uh, these anatomical injection experiments. And you can, the much easier way without colored viral vectors is just to look at colossal patterns. And I just didn't find that data. I would love to know that. Yeah, I think squirrels would be, would be, highly likely and there there's a i forget the name there's sort of a marsupial analog of squirrels that does have stripes and its anatomical projections was Do, you think gray squirrel or ground squirrel <laughs> well i mean uh, I, think, I thought the ground squirrel actually does have stripe orientation and and may have some of the i don't know about the orientation perhaps, but Striped orientation and anatomical projections. Well, I know that they have V two V three. They're striped. Like David Lyon had a nice paper on this, but uh, and I think my my encoding was that's like brown squirrel, which is like a misnomer of gray squirrel. Right. Sort of like tree shrew is a misnomer of shrew. Right. Um, so I'm sort of curious, like if that if that was gray squirrel or brown squirrel. I guess I'm talking about gray squirrels. Gray squirrels. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. More rodent like that. Yeah. 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 So this look, reminded me of, you know, the fracture maps in, in basal ganglia. Have you yeah. ever like read, so with the same idea, you have local clustering, and then there's this discontinuity. So um, have you ever, and there's the same idea, you're sort of bringing disparate things together to create a new computation, and it's not just simple, you know, topography. Yeah. Have you ever thought about it? With, and also, if you look at... Um, representation of auditory space in the viral oh, forebrain, it's yeah. also clustered. Yeah, you, you see this sort of al alternating representational right. change in a couple different right. regions. I didn't know about basal ganglia. I didn't know about auditory right. cortex. The homunculus also, the, the right. motor yeah. system representation has sort of whole body and then regional. Right. Yeah, I think it makes sense. You need to interleave different representations and wiring efficiency on top of that explains all of it. Yeah. But I think it is important to keep that in mind when you do things like divvy up visual areas. Right. Yeah. So, you know, so there's um, in the 90s, they decided that there's three primary auditory areas. Right. And, for, and you know, Lord knows, you know, and no one can tell you what the difference is. You know, like, you know, in terms of processing, right? And so there, there were three of them. What? <laughs> there were three of them. Well, because there's three map clips, right? right? So you get three map clips, right? So that was the definition, right? And there's subtle anatomical differences, right? But like, you couldn't, you know, there's no, there's not even a guess of like looking at, you know, if you look at receptive field properties of what difference there are. Yeah. You know, so I, I you know. The mouse visual areas, not all of them again, but. That has sort of worn out similarly. Yeah. People expected much more clear functional differences. Right. It's just yeah. Kind of... <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, so you know, I just wonder maybe it's not, maybe it is just one area. Yeah. I mean, they have distinct output patterns, definitely. But um also the stripes and macaque v2. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's going on here, have very distinct output patterns. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Well, we should all work together. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? That sounds nice, yeah. Are you accepting postdoctoral organization? I don't know. Apply and we'll see. We're very competitive. <laughs> Old postdocs accepted. Thanks, guys. This was fun. Man, I want to read that.